let's go ahead and get started with chapter three in the Hartmann text. So just like we heard last week from Mr. Bernard, with grafting, you can either do propagation out in the field or you can do it in a facility at the bench. So whether it's done in the field, orchard, right out in the forest, um, in a garden like our raised beds that we have at horticulture or inside of the greenhouse, that's all propagation. And this generally is going to involve young plants. With the woody perennials, we typically have to hold on to them longer to get them hardened and to get them into a state where they're ready to grow and flourish. Uh, but in general, propagation concerns young plants. And for that reason, a little bit more environmental control is required. So we call the material that we're propagating the propagules. So this could either be our tiny cuttings or the seeds themselves. And we're going to manage the microclimate, the edaphic factors, which are gonna be the uh, structure and composition of either soil or media. So this could be potting soil, mineral soil, or things like our rock wool and peat. And then biotic factors as well, uh, concerning pests and pathogens in particular. Okay, so I love uh, this flow chart that we have here with the plant. It looks very, very simple. And then we have a really long list of things to think about here. So in terms of the atmospheric factors, we want to have light that is of the uh, right quality. So it needs to fall within the right spectrum, as well as sufficient quantity or intensity. For propagation, our temperature is typically going to be between 75 and 80 if we're using bottom heat. We also want to consider gas exchange. So here they have atmospheric involving gas exchange, but you'll also notice that gas exchange with oxygen is also in included below ground under the edaphic factors. So carbon dioxide can have a fertilizing effect, and this is important for young plants as well as for our larger mature plants. We want to uh, control ethylene. Ethylene is responsible for ripening. So in the right conditions, it can be uh, beneficial. However, if you have uh, plants that are dying inside of a dome, those that are senescing and um, you see that the leaves are falling off and upsizing, most likely there's gonna be accumulation of ethylene inside of the dome for that tray. And since ethylene is a gas, that could potentially ruin uh, the rest of the tray. All right, and we also want to control water, especially in the form of vapor, right, or fog in terms of humidity. The biotic factors, like I mentioned, are gonna be the pathogens and pests. Our edaphic or below ground factors uh, include many of the same things here. Um, the propagation substrate or medium is different than what we see for the foliage. So this could be our peat, our rock wool, potting soil. Um, and then also the dynamics of the flat and the liner. So here, when you look at the, the shape of the vessel that's holding the roots, if you imagine that this is like a tiny pot for propagation, Okay, this is common for the woody plants. One thing that you'll notice here is that there is a very small diameter for the depth of this vessel. So it allows the roots to grow pretty deep, but not really wide. Okay, you'll also see um, in this chapter that there are some propagation container containers that have netting or slits on the outside of this type of container. And those are going to expose the roots to air, which is going to air prune them. So you are controlling the 
growth of the roots in that way. Um, other than that, let's see, we can also consider the different types of trays that you can use. So remember on the first day I showed you guys that there are uh, propagation trays that have only tiny slits on the bottom. So those are gonna allow for drainage so that you manage to have a good gas exchange and some oxygen in the bottom of the tray. It doesn't become anaerobic, uh, but we also had the flats that had many, many uh, slots in them and they actually looked almost like netting. And those allowed for quite a bit more gas exchange and also for the bottom of the soil to dry out a little bit. Okay, so the way that uh, they described it here sounds a little bit complicated, but it's really just simply you know, how is the plant interacting with the plastic containers and the flats? Uh, when they mention liners, liners are going to be propagated cuttings and they're sold for usually a pretty cheap price. This could be, you know, 50 cents to a dollar. And these are two to three inches tall. Okay. And typically when they're sold to the nursery, the nursery will grow them up a little bit bigger. Um, or sometimes unrooted liners are sold and, you know, the customer will root them themselves. All right, so also under biotic here, considering the below ground factors, we have some beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi, things like plant growth promoting bacteria, but we could also have weed seeds that can germinate uh, from our substrate or our potting soil as well as pathogens or pests like root aphids or nematodes. So we wanna try and control all of these things about this little plant. Okay, so we're going to try and engineer an environment that is going to deliver what is needed and control things uh, so that we don't see as many pest and pathogen outbreaks. Okay, so we can consider about light, things like irradiance, that's gonna be the light intensity, the day length or the photo period, which means how long out of the day we leave the lights on, and then also the light quality, referring to the color of the light. So remember that our uh, photosynthetically active radiation is going to fall primarily in the red and blue spectra. Okay, uh, humidity control, also important. Temperature, I mentioned briefly. And then also mineral nutrition. So for today, I will go just about right up to mineral nutrition and we'll talk about mineral nutrition next week. Okay, so here we have a couple of different heating systems, starting with the gas fire radiant heater, which you can see is uh, running across the top of the truss here. And this figure on the uh, far left, I should say on the top left, uh, we have a forced air heating system, which is actually blowing and forcing the hot air into the environment. Uh, this is a, on the lower right at sea, a greenhouse that is equipped with its own hot water boilers. And on D here, we can see potentially where that hot water is headed, which is for below the bench heating. So we can see in this chapter, there are some examples of just heating below the bench, how this is shown, and then also actually in the root zone. Uh, there's also solar heating. Solar heating is not going to actually involve solar panels, but a similar kind of idea where you'll have a a uh, collection of barrels holding water and they will have um, a dark, like a black material that will absorb heat from the sun. Okay, um, and then also environmental controls. 
the environmental controls in these slides are a little bit outdated. So as you can see, we have the um, analog and then computerized. For the most part, we're going to have computerized or digital environmental controls, uh, but I still have a couple of analog timers as well. Okay, so here you can see some examples of the different propagation structures and then for what type of procedure they're used. Okay, so this is very general. So for example, if we're looking at the indoor micropropagation facilities, of course, yes, we're doing micropropagation there. Um, and in general, only micro cuttings. Um, it isn't entirely true, though, that there are no seedlings being produced in micropropagation. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to start with seedlings in our uh, lab, and then we're going to take cuttings from those and try to multiply them into a larger population. Okay, so you might start by germinating a seed and then using that as your material for micro cuttings and just starting it in a sterile environment and keeping it there. I wanted you guys to be aware that um, micro grafting is also something that exists. Okay. Um, layering, not really used in micro propagation. And uh, liner pro prop production is sometimes used um, with micro propagation. So this is also a little bit out of date here. Okay, we'll see examples of the uh, hotbeds and the closed case propagation in the next couple of slides. Okay, and you can see for the most part, uh, micro propagation is not used in these other types of structures. Um, and we're going to use the closed case propagation, the hot frames for cuttings, and then for hardwood and semi-hardwood cuttings, we can use the closed case propagation lath houses, also um, referred to as shade houses, since the laths are less commonly used, and now we usually use the opaque shade coverings, or um, other types of systems within greenhouses, like the propagating frames, or um, contact polyethylene systems. Okay. Grafting, these uh, plants can be propagated in any of these environments. And then for layering, air layering is gonna be done in greenhouses. It can be done with the uh, closed case propagation uh, and with the lath houses or shade houses. Okay, and then any of these can be used for uh, liner production and for the acclimatization that's needed after the liners are rooted, uh, but especially the lath houses or shade houses. Those are gonna be used most extensively. Okay, so lovely here. These here on the top left almost look similar to the ones at um, Cal Poly Pomona. We have some gutter connected greenhouses. So you can see, you know, they share a wall in between, and then they also have this uh, gutter that's running in between them. Um, and the one here on B on the top is an example of the Gutter Connect Bow House. Uh, so when it says non-load carrying, this is typically going to refer to uh, if you have snow in your area because you can get quite a bit of weight on top of the greenhouse and it can collapse. So if you need the roof to be uh, load bearing, then the Gutter Connect Trust House example that's on the bottom of B would be a better choice. And here we can see what they actually look like also. C for the uh, cross tie, and then on D we actually have the Trust House. Okay. Um, there's a couple of different types of benching. So here we have uh, some movable benches. This is under C, where you can see that these uh, large benches inside the greenhouse can move from one side to the other. 
This can help to maximize the space because you can, um, instead of leaving a large aisle open just in one place, you can roll everything over to one side. You can change the position of the aisle um, and get into where you need to work. Let's see, we also have an example um, where they have simply put all of the plants on the, the floor. And then um, here on the end where the plants are being moved out into full sun conditions. Okay, so passive ventilation or retractable roof greenhouses have become pretty uh, popular because this allows for the heat to be released into the environment instead of kept in the greenhouse. Okay, and then um, we also have an example with uh, thermal curtains. So it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you look at the black arrow here on D, you can see that there are thermal curtains um, that are going to help with heat both in terms of blocking it out during the summer and then trapping it within the greenhouse so that it stays warm during the winter. Okay, so here we have a polyethylene coated greenhouse, one of the more low cost and simple ones. Um, so they're talking here about media beds that have been sterilized with methyl bromide. Uh, methyl bromide is a fumigant that is um, very toxic. It's useful, especially for killing weed seeds. In California, it's only allowed in research settings. It's not allowed in production uh, because it has been, for the most part, phased out. Um, and this would be done when the workers were not present because it is very toxic. So these guys are coming in after the fact and um, they're transferring the. Uh, cuttings into rooting floor beds. So they're actually coming in and just sticking the cuttings that are unrooted right into these uh, media floors. So it's actually pretty cool, minus the methyl bromide. Okay, and then we can see um, that they have a uh, mist propagation and we can see the crop as it's moving along as well. Okay, so Speaking of movable benches, there are also movable bench systems that are um, automated or use hydraulic lifts. Oh, and this is the one where they actually have the um, plants on the propagation house floor. Uh, and as you can see, there's uh, some overhead nozzles here on D. Those are providing the intermittent mist. Um, the intermittent mist is going to help to uh, keep up the propagation environment human. Um, and it also potentially has the effect of washing off spores of fungi. This is a little bit controversial because some people also say that it would promote fungi to have such a wet environment. However, the intermittent mist is commonly used in uh, large scale propagation in greenhouses. And this is kind of similar to what you would do if you guys ever uh, are making clones and then you uh, go and just spray with a spray bottle. This is just on a larger scale. Okay, so this is really cool here. We have a diagram of a recirculating irrigation system and it has also got uh, floor heating. So there are hot water pipes that are running through the floor to keep that root zone nice and warm between 75 and 80 degrees. Uh, so here, here's where the plants are growing in the greenhouse. This kind of looks maybe like a gutter connected greenhouse. Okay, so we have our irrigation water that's uh, running across the, the trays or the benches. Okay, and then we have the pipes with the hot water going through the floor. Um, the tank refill is coming from over here on the right. So that would be like the original water and nutrient solution. Okay, but after the water circulates through the greenhouse, it's being returned here to the uh, water chain for the heater, which interest, interestingly seems to be going through. Um, also, here we have filter for return to the fertilizer tank. 
Um, so this is useful because it allows the water and the nutrients to be uh, recycled instead of being discarded. Um, I also thought it was interesting that in the chapter, they did talk about chlorine as a sterilant. And uh, they talked about it not just in the way that we were using it for foliage with our propagation of woody cuttings, but they also talked about um, the chlorine being used in the water systems to control algae and um, fungi in the water, the irrigation water itself. Okay, so here you can see an example of the root zone heating. Um, so importantly here, so they have these coils for root zone heating, and they also have a sensor. So it is very important if you're going to use the root zone heating that you have some way of controlling it. Uh, we do have some of these at horticulture that we'll use for bottom heating. We can try that with some of our tissue cultures. And uh, this sensor is going to uh, essentially be hooked to a thermostat. So say you set your temperature to 78 degrees, the heating element will turn off once the uh, root zone has reached 78 degrees. Otherwise, it's just gonna keep going and your roots are gonna get cooked. Okay, here are um, some coverings that are used for uh, thermal protection. This is going to help to contain the heat in the winter and to provide some shade uh, during the summer. All right, so on B, you can actually see the detail. It almost reminds me of like a radial tire. Um, they, they have a polyester fabric here that's aluminized. So it looks like you know through the fibers, there's some aluminum that's been woven through it. And, um, it looks relatively thick to me. However, it still allows for 46% light transmission. And this is going to go over the regular polyethylene covering. So it's gonna be applied over it from the outside. Okay, another option for shade is gonna to be to use a shade cloth. You I've seen that at horticulture, we have the black opaque shade cloths. Um, here, they're using a red shade cloth. And I thought this was really interesting. This is specific for propagation and rooting. And the red shade cloth is actually going to help the roots to begin coming out and also to uh, develop as well. So here we're going to get more red spectra and less blue and green when the red shade cloth is used. Okay, so this is a little bit more high tech. It's also gonna be a little more energy efficient using the polycarbonate covered greenhouse because it's gonna lose less heat. Um, here we can see we have exhaust fans on the end of the building at A. Those are going to pull the air out. And on the other end, as you can see on B, we have this large cooling pad that is um, evaporating water. So when the air is pulled through the building, it's gonna come through this evaporative cooling pad. And in that way, it's going to cool the room. Um, water has a high heat capacity, so this is one of the ways that the greenhouse can be uh, cool. Okay, um, so glass is gonna be the, the most expensive. It's also breakable. We can also use the polyethylene, which was that flexible plastic covering that we saw in the beginning. Okay, and then for the rigid coverings, there are things like acrylic, you guys might be familiar with plexiglass or the polycarbonate, okay, which was just on their previous slide. Okay, so here we have some electronic controls, which I thought this was a little bit funny because if you look at the computer on B, it looks very old. It doesn't look like the computers that we have now. But the same idea here um, being that all of these 
uh, different aspects like temperature, light, uh, and gas can all be controlled electronically. So if we take the example of this uh, CO2 sensor, the CO2 is typically emitted in a regulated fashion. So um, it's not just all released into the room, but similar to our thermostat, we're gonna set our uh, sensor to a desired CO2 level. For example, like 1500 parts per million, and then that will allow the CO2 to reach that level and the controls will keep it at that level. The um, valve would be open if the levels are below 1500, but once they reach 1500, then the valve would close. So it's all automated. Okay, oh, here we have an example on D. Um, let's see, or C, we have high pressure sodium. It looks like this on D could also be a high pressure sodium or a ceramic metal halide light. And um, this can either be used for supplemental lighting. So you can see here on E how um, they just have like a low fluorescent type of light here or incandescent lighting. That would be supplemental lighting. Um, but the um, C and D could also be used for photoperiodic lighting, for example, to extend the photo period and prevent a short day plant from uh, flowering sooner than you want it to. Okay, so we also have, uh, we have another example of a weather station up here on top of the greenhouse. This is what we'll have in our new greenhouses at Agricultural Education up here. Um, and they're focusing here on vapor pressure deficit. I'm not a, an expert in this particular area, but the idea here is that they're using fog propagation. So they're actually using a humidifier in the greenhouse. And this does encourage plant growth. So plants in higher humidity um, in general, they're going to grow more as opposed to if you know they're in a very dry environment. And with that being said, if you have too much humidity, then it's going to encourage things like your powdery mildew or your botrytis. Uh, so this is a balancing act and the vapor pressure deficit has to be controlled uh, by one of these sensors. Okay, so here we have uh, our example of the opaque covering which is the black shade cloth here on the B. Um, and these types of hoop houses, you can see they're not very tall, are specifically for overwintering or vernalization of material. In um, our environment, in the San Fernando Valley, we're a little bit more concerned about protecting from heat, um, but Protecting from frost is also very important in horticultural production. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these systems. We have some examples on the next couple of slides. Okay, so here on the top left for under A, we have glass covered cold frames. So this is for ground cover or the example that they're giving us is for ground cover production. Um, and these are almost like little windows that pop up to garden beds. Under B here, we also have an example of the wood sash. So if you look at this pattern of the wood sash, it's going to give a little bit of uh, physical protection to the cuttings, and it's going to give a little bit of shade as well. So it looks similar to a lath house, just a really tiny one. Okay, and then they mentioned here that wood is not typically used as a building material for these. You've seen um, that we used, you know, PVC and poly for the greenhouses that we have, or I should say for the hoop houses that we have for overwintering over at horticulture. Um, on the other hand, if you want something that is um, more sturdy, you can also go for galvanized steel bow house. 
it looks like on C uh, we have galvanized steel. Okay. I really love these beds. I've seen something similar in San Luis Obispo for um, herbaceous cuttings. And here we have almost like a greenhouse within a greenhouse. And uh, what we're looking at here is we have all of these liners that are in here for rooting and they're all tucked into protective co covering. So instead of having just one little tray with a dome, now we have an entire bench. You know, maybe this is something like 30 feet long um, that is covered with this poly uh, material. Okay, sometimes we'll also have intermittent mist that happens underneath the coverings. Okay, and gradually as these are being hardened off and they get closer to being ready to ship out, they'll be vented. So you can see here where you have on B where the side of the uh, covering has been lifted up. Okay, so it's partially vented. That would be like on our little domes if we open them just halfway. Okay, and then you can see on C where there are some rows that are uh, a little bit ahead. So maybe those are two weeks ahead of the others and the covering has already been removed. All right, under containers. So you guys have seen flats um, and we've mostly used those for support, like a secondary container to hold all of our pots in. Um, but you also saw that um, in the previous slide, sometimes the flats are directly sewn with seeds or directly stuck with the liners that are going to be uh, rooted. Okay, of course there are plastic pots. There are also which alternatives though, and there was some attention put toward this in the book, because you know, plastic pots may not be the most environmentally friendly. You've seen that we reuse them and wash them, and you know that is somewhat of a pain. Fiber pots are nice because they are a natural instead of a synthetic material, and they also could be washed a different way, like in a, a washing machine. Um, paper pots can be made from recycled paper. Those are useful, especially in propagation where we don't need to keep them for very long. Okay, um, other materials are gonna include peat, cocoa fiber, uh, expanded foam, like the Oasis cubes, and also the rock gold blocks. Okay, there are also uh, larger growing containers that are plastic, like our one gallons or three gallons. Then, it's not as popular in the United States, but we do actually have some of these at horticulture. There are some polyethylene bags, so we'll use them. They're like little black bags, almost like the black trash bags, but they're small to use for little pots. Um, and we'll use them when we're out of everything, sort of just in a pinch. They're very low cost. Okay, wooden containers. I think we have a slide on this coming up. Those are going to be more useful for the uh, large plants when we're talking about like an eight to 10 year old tree. Okay, great. So here we can see a paper pot system and it looks like here they're actually making their own mix and their own pots uh, with this machine. So um, here they're taking their liners and direct rooting them and look how tiny these little cuttings are that they're using. So this, um, these are actually just regular liners, but it, to me, it almost resembles what you'd see for the direct sticking in the ex vitro uh, micropropagation. So taking plants from tissue culture and sticking them in the paper plots, they might be about the same size. Okay, it says peat light media. We will talk about peat light next week. Um, they've given us some recipes, so that's really helpful uh, if you wanna save a little bit of money. All right. So you can see these are in the paper sleeve tube. Um, you can see also that they're well rooted. These are poinsettia. And then if you look at this tray, this insert that they've used for the rooting, it actually has these vertical lines or divots that are coming out. 
And that's going to help pre prevent the root circling. So I think that we have a slide for this coming up as well, but if you've ever heard the term that the, you know, the seedlings or the plants have become root bound, um, it can make it difficult for the plants to take up nutrients. So this is one way to prevent that is actually from the physical structure of uh, the tray or the vessel itself. Another thing is just to transplant things in a timely manner. Okay, yes, so here is an example of a tray that does the air root pruning. And in this example, you can see that there are a bunch of slots uh, on this container and it's not put in a secondary tray that is really protecting it and keeping it humid. This is quite exposed to air. And as the roots try to go out of those little slots, they'll be pruned just by the air and those parts will dry out. Um, and yes, here we have our uh, flow chart for nursery production systems. Okay, so first of all, the propagation by cuttings, these are going to you know, potentially start out just from cuttings and flats, like we've seen in most of the examples, but it could certainly be started from trays that are seeded. Okay, uh, we might also have a bunch of liners or small plants that have been grafted or plants that have been hardened off from tissue culture. So those rooted cuttings are then gonna go into liner production. Remember that those liners are plants that are about two to three inches tall. And then those are going to be, move forward to the greenhouse container production where they're actually being grown out or out to the field. Now, if you use direct sticking, into the uh, liner pods that you were going to sell the liners in in the first place, you could potentially eliminate one of the production steps. And if you have a fairly successful protocol, that can um, speed things up a little bit. Okay, and then of course it's gonna go out for production. Um, let's take a little look here um, at the forestry nursery production system starting with propagation of seeds and cuttings, then going to transplanting, moving of rooted liners and seedlings or up canning, right? So up potting or up canning would be going from a smaller vessel, like maybe our four inch pots into our one gallons. And then finally out planting or transplanting to the field site where those trees are going to grow out in the forest. Okay, so here we have a sheet. This is on A where they're talking about the propagation sheet. So these are all connected together, similar to like how we had our six packs, how they're connected. Okay, but they have hinge sheets for propagation, the seedling liners. And as you can see, these look like they are some sort of coniferous tree. And they're in these deep containers that have a small diameter. So it's gonna allow the roots to grow quite a bit downward, not as much uh, out to the sides. Okay, you can see here we have uh, in a production system, we have a bunch of four to six inch uh, rock wool blocks here. So once you have your cuttings or your seedlings well rooted into the plugs, the plugs can be directly transferred into these larger rock wool blocks. Under C here, looks like maybe for C and D, we have the containers that are ridged. They're specialized to prevent root circling. So this is intended to you know, keep the plants from becoming root bound. Uh, we talked about air pruning and the ridge containers. Now here's an example where the containers have been treated with copper hydroxide. And you can see on B, how it looks kind of like a greenish color, a coppery color. And these pots were treated that way, again, to prevent the plant from becoming root bound. And you can see under figure C here, or figure 323C, that the plant on the left was grown in the containers with a copper hydroxide, and then the plant on the right was not. So this is going to be a form of chemical pruning for the roots. 
And there are lots of other plastic containers. Um, so they mention here that the there are often plastic resins used to treat these containers. The biggest problem is um, that if you leave these out in the sun for a long time, of course, we're growing our plants in the sun, that they become oxidized and they can uh, crunch or crumble and uh, can't be reused uh, indefinitely. That's the same issue with these poly bags. Here's a poly bag on the right, like the ones that I were talking about or I was talking about. And um, these are low cost and can be useful. But the problem is they break down much faster, especially if they have been left in heat or light. So we have had this problem also where we had a whole bag of these things or a whole box and they were just all falling apart. We had to throw them away. Okay, there's also some interesting sort of hybrid container field methods that are used, especially for tree production in nurseries. And you can see here how we have some uh, fabric pots or plastic pots that are being put into the ground. Um, the plants are in the container because they're eventually going to be taken out and you know shipped to the consumer. But um, this allows the top part of the plant to be well hardened off. But you'll see in F here that the pots have been um, at the bottom, they've been wrapped in an insulative material because the roots are going to be really delicate since they have been um, planted in this pot in the ground. So that's the uh, disadvantage with this one. Okay, and then finally here, um, there are also the wooden containers. And these are especially useful for mature landscape trees. These are going to be a lot easier to break open than if you had you know, a very large plastic container because these can just be broken open at four sides. And you can see uh, these are not easy to move. Uh, we have a 72 inch box. It's about 8,100 pounds and it needs to be moved by a forklift. So that is as far as we're going to go today. And I'm gonna go over these media and mixes as well as nutrition. And I think we have a little bit about um, integrated pest management as well next week.